Hey guys, welcome to part two of the video. We're gonna start here. No, I'm kidding. I just wanted to do that. It's a joke. Anyway, uh, this is part two to a video that we just had talking about design, which yes, all of that drawing. But um, what I did not get into was the discussion about how to actually design or put forward my estimate, right? So I've got my square, my not square square. That one was really bad. Oh. I've got my square. I've got my attached garage, not surveyed, not surveyed. I've got a cantilever crack, so I know my scope of work. It's about there. Remember flat lot, flat subdivision. No water issues, no transpiration issues, good grading, good all fun stuff like that. Uh, accomplished list, the client was worried about, accomplish, was worried about money. Did not care about lifting, eh, lift, and 25 year warranty. Now, I said something in the last video that um, some people argued about, and that's fine. Uh, I enjoy a good discussion. If the homeowner is concerned about a 25 year warranty, what they're concerned about is dealing with it one time. They're concerned about liability issues, they're concerned about just actually fixing the problem, right? So the discussion that I would have with them in regards to the paradigm that we discussed, this was do nothing, do not proceed. And uh, we wound up here with uh, what polymer. And then we talked about how concrete wasn't a good plan, so you have compaction grouting, like cementitious cementitious grout, and that's a that's a big no, right? No grade beams, foundation replacement was out. And we had steel underpinning. This is your push or helical piers, right? Underpinning. That's cool. And we were somewhere here, right? So we're gonna do that. So, what we start with, there's, okay. <laughs> it can be another video very shortly. It's about reading your contracts. Oh, is that, <laughs> yeah, anyway. So this is my scope of work. There is a litany of unknowns. Oh, this, sorry, one more thing. We were at 0, 0.0 by the front door. There's minus 0, 1, it's minus 0, 3. This was still pretty, I think I did minus 1.0 right here. I think I did, I don't know, minus 0.8, whatever. Minus 2.3 on the other side of the cantilever, 2.8, minus 3.0. And so we know that's like sloping after this way with a little tilt that way, basically, right? Um, so we've got the scope of work, we've got what the client wants, we've narrowed it down to, to uh, compaction grouting via polymer grouting, not cementitious grouting. Uh, and steel underpinning, that's kind of where we're at. There is still a litany of unknowns, right? I don't know the soil type. I don't know, I mean, I've got an idea if it's clay or not. I don't know, I don't know if there's peat underneath there. I don't know if there's a landfill that's gonna cause issues. I don't know how deep the problem is. <laughs> so these piers can go down a hundred feet. Um, so everyone at this point starts making assumptions. We're making assumptions on the footing sizes. The footing sizes we assume are in compliance with the California Building Code. I think it's chapter 17. If I'm wrong, then it's chapter 18. One of those is special inspections, one of those is foundations. Whichever one it is, uh, we're assuming that we are in compliance with the building code or the existing is in compliance. Um, so we're assuming things about the loading of the structure Remember wood frame and stucco structure, a frame roof with shingles. We're assuming the strength of the materials that compose the superstructure. Remember that's everything above the foundation. We're assuming that the foundation was constructed with good rebar, so it's not gonna crumble as, start as, as soon as we start doing our thing. There is a lot at this point in time that we are making assumptions about. So steel that needs to do, steel that needs, <sighs> Steel that is bracing an entire section of foundation will obviously change your price because when putting in steel underpinning, if you're going to dig a three by three hole to pop your pier on, right, and a three by three hole, we'll call it five feet away to pop a second pier on, there's a lot more labor 
digging a three by three and a three by three versus digging this whole damn thing out to expose the footing, right? Plus some risk, by the way, but that's gonna be about the production video that we're gonna bring up. Letter, like I said, V2, it's gonna be very exciting. But um, there, there's just, there's more time, there's more labor, there's a lot more stuff invested, uh, there's a lot more dirt that's gotta come out and go back in, there's just a lot more, right? And we don't know that until we get into the engineering portion of all this. It's part of why I recommend to everybody that you get that test pier that I was talking about. We would push uh, in a test pier in this condition, I would go on the descending slope side, which there's not one, but I would go where the home is the heaviest, which is closest to the corner, in the area with the greatest movement, which is minus 3.0. So I would do a test pier here or here. If I did a DCP, I'd pop one here and maybe one out front, probably. And SPT, same thing. I would do it like out here and out here, maybe one over here. Right, that's just what I'd do. Um, you pop that test pier on and it goes down 100 feet. That is not the assumption that the contractor was making when he gave you your proposal, the one that you signed. Uh, same thing with us, like if we're injecting polymer, we're making assumptions about how deep we need to go. This is based off the loading of the structure and how deep into the soil that loading dissipates into, uh, how heavy it is, how much polymer we're gonna use based off of uh, assumptions about how strong the soil is. And we won't know any of that until we do our DCP tests or SPT tests in order to extract the soil or CPT tests that give us a lot more information, right? So <laughs> that's why I like saying civil engineering is the most inexact version of engineering. Because guys, we got all of this information from the last 24 minute video all the way up to this one. It's so much information. And still for pricing and estimating on spacing and materials, it's like <laughs> into a dark, right? I, I, I don't know. So when we talk about contracts, uh, which will be a different video, there's a lot of assumptions that we make and we have to protect ourselves in the contracts with, right? So don't be surprised. Well, it's not don't be surprised, but don't be surprised because of Murphy or his law, at least. Uh, when they give you an estimate for the pier to go down 30 feet, then they do it, and like I present you with that contract, you sign it and life is good. Then we get started and I hit you with the change order because the piers went down 70 if you had a good, I'm going to call it what it is, sales rep, if you had a good sales rep who was on site with you, they've already had that conversation with you, let you know it could be a possibility and it doesn't come like blindside in the middle of construction when somebody's already torn up your house. Uh, so in a perfect world, that, that's how it works. This is why engineering and permitting is so important too, right? It's why special inspection is important and all that fun jazz. Um, I, I see a lot of issues that that come around here, right? So I'm gonna give you an estimate. That's what it is, it's an estimate. A lot of people have a lot of language and you sign that estimate and it uh, enters us into a formal contract, but oftentimes uh, you're hit with a change order right after. So my discussion with my homeowner who's worried about the dollars is budget 30% over whatever it is I'm giving you, right? Always get to tell them 30% over. Because if you don't use 30%, then when they're done, they can fix the cracks and the drywall and put new flooring in and call it a day. If they do need more money, you have that 30% buffer, right? There's no reason for, for a contract to go up by 50% unless you increase the scope of work later or uh, if there's just some wild conditions that exist. But if that happens, that's a conversation that should have been had with you already. Um, it's just, it's just the thing, right? That's a conversation that they should be having. If they're, if they're not, they're not doing their job. I'm sorry. So for the push piers and helical piers, a safe assumption for engineering is a five foot, five foot span between your piers, right? Wrap the corner, and that's what? Two feet to the corner. That's wrapping the corner. We talked about that in our video, I think. Two foot, five foot, five foot, right? So five foot spacing, it's a safe assumption. You can go six feet, especially in really good footing conditions. You can space these six feet, no problem. Wouldn't even complain. I start getting sketchy about seven feet. There's some engineers who support it. There's some who don't. I get sketchy about seven feet, um, eight foot, nine foot, 10 foot. I've seen it done, not recommended, <laughs> just, I mean, unless you're bracing the whole damn thing with steel, but not recommended, right? 
So as an inspector, I'm looking for like that sliding glass door in your back diner that is eight feet wide that breaches your five foot spacing, right? So I'll, what I'll do is these piers, I'll pop one on one side, one on the other, and I'll put some angle iron on the in-between. So I've got sliding glass door, right? And I pop my pier, uh, well, footing. I pop my pier on here. And then whop, whop. And I pop a pier on here. Now this spacing is eight feet. And this footing right here might not be able to support those loads on both sides because you push, you push up on this side and up on this side and create a bow and eventually a failure point crack right in the center, right? So sometimes if I look at the side view of that, I've got my house, I've got my footing. Wow, that was terrible, so sorry. Um, So I cut that off, I pop my pier. So instead of putting a pier on this and driving down, what they'll do is they'll put a uh, piece of angle iron, L-shaped, six by six minimum. I prefer half inch, some people do quarter, whatever. And they span, they span this whole distance with that angle iron to help reinforce the footing so you don't crack it in the center when you're doing the lift, right? So angle iron here, boom, 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 boom. And one passed. All right, so I've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven piers. Eleven piers. You build your estimate. I'm not going to get into pricing with you guys. Uh, I will tell you that these are generally assumed at about 30 feet. Most contractors do 30 feet. Some of them do 20 feet. Um, but I got a number of piers to operate off of, right? You've got your angle iron, angle iron, 10 feet, and you've got what? So engineering will design this as a structure. They pretend that your concrete footing is a beam and the piers support the beam. So technically by structural design, all you need is the piers. But once you start getting into geotech and depending on jurisdictions and stuff like that, if I pick this up three inches, there's a three inch void underneath and they want you to fill that up in order to restore the soil support. That's where you get into like the polymer void fill or if you're in LA, often you'll do the, uh, oh, hey, LA has an LARR now. That's exciting. Uh, or if you're in LA, you'll have to do the, uh, the cementitious grout fill in order to restore the soil load. So I also know that I have to assume polymer, or you know what, let's just call it void fill, is however much here, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna calculate that for everyone or talk about how contractors do that, but you got the void fill. Three inches, three inches, safe assumption, boom. Uh, for the type of project here, right, I also want to check this out, which based off my spacing looks to be about 10 feet. And know that when you're lifting the perimeter like this, it affects about four foot inside the slab, right? So now you're creating a bowing situation. So I also, in this condition, would go back, I need a color, <laughs> would go back and probably recommend a cementitious grout, void fill, what compaction grouting, whatever you want to use in order to fill all of this to properly support the inside of the slab and lift everything up appropriately. Otherwise, you risk cracking it along this line, especially the further down these numbers are and you're just trying to pick this whole thing up, just abusing the slab, right? So that's, that's my peering method, right, for polymer, There's argument on whether or not a four foot, five foot, or six foot spacing is appropriate. What I will tell you is that the science generally supports a four foot spacing. Um, so I know where I'm going with my DI. And I'm just really shooting this whole thing. So I just calculate how much I need for uh, deep soil injection. Deep soil injection. And then slab lifting on the inside, right? And some void fill too. Because we picked up paint. But anyway, so deep soil slab lifting void fill for polymer cementitious grout injection throughout the uh, entire thing. Now, uh, we talked about going 30 feet with the piers. What about polymer? What do we make assumptions for? So assuming that the load of a structure dissipates to about 10% at twice its width, that's like 80 feet deep. It's not enough. 
Uh, so we start making assumptions about like how to support the weight of the structure. We talked about this being a single story, A-frame roof with shingles, uh, wood frame and stucco structure on a slab on grade foundation system, which we assume isn't 10 feet deep. Uh, so based off a structure like this, I would probably recommend about two depths of injection for stabilization, inject the whole thing and level it back up. This can change during engineering. All of this can change during engineering. Okay, so a lot of assumptions are being made, of course, but this is sort of the evaluation that I would do on a flat lot, flat subdivision, no water issues, good drainage, um, not a highly expansive clay soil, uh, no plumbing leak that was reported that happened on it, um, wood frame and stucco structure, single story, A-frame roof, asphalt shingles, and a slab on grade foundation system. That's a lot of conditions, and that's why we're going to do about four or five different design videos for you guys. Anyway, um, that's it. <laughs> oh. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please drop them down below. Um, like, subscribe, share. Um, I think I'm supposed to ask for that for every video. And that's it, guys. That was a lot. But thank you. Thank you for your patience, and uh, hopefully you get some good feedback on this.